Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session on Consumer Driven Health Accounts, FSAs, HRAs, and HSAs. My name is Chelsea Smith. I am a Learning and Development Specialist at Action Benefits, and I am here today to talk to you about the ins and outs of what is going to happen to your Consumer Driven Health Accounts through uh, the end of this year and beyond. Let's talk about our session outcomes for today. So what are we going to be talking about in this session? First, we are going to hopefully by the end of the session be able to identify some key elements of health savings accounts. We should be able to identify key elements of health reimbursement arrangements, and we should be able to identify key elements of flexible spending accounts. So those three different accounts that fall into those consumer directed health categories, talking about those three um, types of accounts today. We'll get into a little more of the uh, categorized versions of HSAs and HRAs that might be a little more specific and new, um, but we will spend most of the time in these other three categories right here. So consumer-driven health accounts or CDH accounts give employers and consumers some additional flexibility in using their healthcare dollars. In our show today, we'll highlight three types of consumer-driven health accounts, the health savings accounts, health reimbursement arrangements, or sometimes I also hear them be called um, health reimbursement accounts. I've heard both, to be honest, and flexible spending accounts. And then we'll take a peek at a couple of the more nuanced ones, the more uh, detailed ones like Hucera's and ICRA's, but we'll get to those later. The chart that's on the screen right now provides a brief overview of all three of those accounts, but we're going to go into more detail about those items in a moment. Um, from this chart, you'll be able to notice that there, um, that there are a couple main differences between these types of accounts and who can contribute, which is those three are, who can contribute to them, what can we do with the money that's in each of those accounts, and how long the money can stay in the accounts. Those are kind of the three main differences between these three types of accounts. But before I forget, I do want to make sure I note to you that some employers might allow 2.5 month grace periods on FSA funds, and others may allow a rollover from year to year, uh, but they can't offer both options. So though that is the only one that kind of has a pick and choose where you can only offer one of two options. But uh, I will mention it again throughout our journey today, but I just wanted to throw that out there here and now while we're thinking about it. So let's start with health savings slash health spending accounts. Again, I've heard both terms um, used to describe this type of account. So health savings accounts may be used by consumers to either pay, I guess not either, it's three things, to pay current qualified medical expenses, like over-the-counter items, as well as fees charges, charged by providers and pharmacies. So like co-pays and, uh, you know, uh, costs of your drugs. You can use this money to save for future qualified medical expenses. Uh, and you can use this to save for your retirement. So any health health expenses you might incur after you retire and no longer are receiving um, health insurance through your employer. But, big but here, consumers who become eligible for Medicare by turning 65 aren't able to contribute to health spending accounts anymore after that happens. But, double but, they may continue to withdraw from them throughout their retirement years. So it's important to make sure that clients understand that they need to have all of their qualms with their HSA squared away um, and make sure it's just how they want it before they turn 65. So whether that means maxing it out or having some money in it, having no money in it, having money, to, whatever it is that they want to do, make sure that they have that all squared away before they turn 65 because they can no longer contribute to those accounts. They're still there. That money still belongs to them. They can still withdraw. They cannot contribute further. Alrighty. So health savings accounts do have a lot of benefits for the consumers. So I just want to put them all up because I hate having to click through a million times. Okay. So health savings accounts have a couple of advantages. The first one is that they may only be paired with plans that are classified by the IRS as high deductible health plans. Although these plans have high deductibles, they generally have lower premiums in comparison to other plans. So that's kind of where the balance comes in between the high deductible and the lower premium. Um, so as, the, as we know from other health saving or other, um, I'm sorry, insurance plans, um, we can see how the higher the deductible, the lower the premium, the higher the premium, the lower deductible. 
um, this is kind of some way to um, mitigate some of those um, high deductible pains, high deductible uh, plan woes is through some of these HSA accounts. Um, I just call it the HSA account as if it's like a like an ATM ATM machine. Sorry. Um, pairing a health savings account with a plan like this gives consumers more um, financial flexibility because they'll have some money squirreled away to help pay that deductible in theory or any other you know uh, uh, health insurance um, bill or need for money that we talked about earlier, like those deductibles co or I'm sorry, like those copays, over the counter stuff like that. Second, consumers have complete control over the funds that are deposited in this account. It's their money. An employer cannot claim any used balance and consumers can deposit and withdraw at their own discretion without worrying about yearly cutoff dates to use those funds, unlike the other accounts that we're going to talk about. So it's kind of, it, it functions as closely to a traditional savings account as all of these different um, accounts we're going to talk about today, HSAs do. Third, HSAs are portable. This means the account follows the consumer and is not linked to directly to their health plan. If the account is linked to an employer-sponsored plan, the consumer may take the funds with them to their next pursuit. If it's paired with an individual plan, the HSA can also move with the consumer. So let's say if you, I um, worked at a establishment that offered me an HSA and I put $1,000 into that account, that $1,000 does not belong to the company. Uh, I would be able to, if I quit, I could take that money with me, that account with me. Um, and if I took up another job that also offered HSAs, um, that money could be transferred into that job's HSA and I could continue to contribute to that account. Um, or same thing if I was an individual and I had an individual plan with an HSA and I wanted to switch to a different plan with an HSA, I could do that. No problem. That money would get transferred into the HSA. Um, HSA provides consumers flexibility. There are not cutoff dates to withdraw or use funds and members can choose to use the funds to pay for current expenses or save for a qualified future expense, such as an expensive operation. So maybe you know for sure that you're going to um, need a I don't know, knee replacement. Um, you want to make sure you'll be able to pay for that. So you throw some money in that account every week until you have the amount that you want, as long as you don't go over the amount that is um, capped by the federal government on those. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, these accounts also present consumers with savings and investment opportunities. Unused funds in these accounts can be invested in a range of financial instruments like mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and more. I always forget this about HSAs until I go back and give this presentation. That is also another option is this money can be used for investment purposes if you wind up in a situation where you don't, you saved up for an operation, let's say, and you ended up not needing that operation, um, but you don't want that money to go to waste. Great idea. You can invest it. Finally, HSAs are tax advantage accounts, meaning deposits, qualified withdrawals, and qualified investment earnings are all tax free. This can make these accounts intriguing to individuals who seek to grow their wealth in an um, easy kind of path. Uh, so, uh, nearly anyone can contribute to someone's HSA, whether that be the employer, an employee, a family member, or anyone else who wants to help someone uh, cover any qualified health expenses that they might incur. The only people who cannot contribute to an HSA are enrollees, uh, are Medicare enrollees. They can have an HSA that is carried over from when they were Medicare eligible. Uh, I'm sorry, from before they were Medicare eligible. But they, and they can still enroll in a plan that offers HSAs, but they would not be able to benefit from the tax sheltered savings that an HSA provides. They would not be able to contribute to an account. They can withdraw from their previous account that already existed. That money still belongs to them. It doesn't disappear, but they cannot add to that account. So keep that in mind if you are advising someone who is, might be coming up on that age bracket. So the IRS publishes yearly guidelines that govern the contribution and out-of-pocket limits that HSAs and, uh, and health plans, respectively, are subject to. So specifically, these guidelines speak to the yearly contribution limits that consumers might make, catch-up contributions for consumers who are 55 or older, and the threshold for what is considered a high-deductible health plan, and the maximum out-of-pocket amounts that, are, uh, that a consumer could be subject to. So here we have the standard contribution limit at the top of the chart, then the additional catch-up contribution limit after that, 
then the minimum deductibles next, and then the max out-of-pocket amounts. Current year figures, previous year figures, and the change are all shown on this chart here. So last year, technically this year in 2023, we have on the left in the center, we have next year what we're going to be enrolling for, and then we have how much is this change? So the catch-up contribution is the only thing that has not changed this year. Every other amount has risen. So cool, more money that your um, that your clients could save, or you if you have one of these. But what happens if I leave that HSA plan? If a consumer leaves their HSA plan, um, what will happen next is going to depend on kind of the future of where they're headed. If they move to another insurance plan that has another HSA, that money automatically gets rolled over to that HSA. So no worries on their part. If the consumer goes to a plan that doesn't have an HSA, that money is still kept within that account and it can still be used for the same expenses that it was intended for. The money in the account itself essentially still functions in the same way. But the consumer might need to pay additional um, maintenance fees to use the account and must have a compatible HSA health plan to be able to continue to contribute. But of course, the employer con contributions will cease in both situations. So if you do have an account that the employer is contributing to, if you obviously, if you quit that company, they're not going to continue to contribute to that account. But the individual still could um, if they wanted to do that. All right, so that brings us to our first knowledge check. Hopefully you picked up something from those last few moments that will help you in that, with this question. So Jana, 54 and single, is looking to maximize her HSA contributions before she retires. Which of the following would you recommend that she does? Uh, I do want to talk about this question because it is a little um, tricky. Some of you said A, and normally that would be correct. Yes, I would recommend putting away, if, you, if she can swing it and she has that 4K just chilling, absolutely, um, you would throw that in there if she was under 55. She is not. She is 57, right? So what changes because she's 57? She has an extra $1,000 that she can contribute because she's over 55 as that catch-up money. Um, I forgot exactly how I worded it in the chart, but anyone over 55 can submit a grand more to catch up to their um, younger counterparts, right, if they are entering a plan with an HSA right away. So she would contribute the 50. Uh, $5,150. She could do that right away if she wanted, or she could do it over the course of the year as she can. Um, the as the speed at which she um, deposits the money doesn't matter all that much. Um, but if, if you answered A, awesome, you're not wrong. I would just double check the person's age when you're answering a question like this to make sure that they are actually maxing that account out with, with that extra catch up thousand dollars that they would be able to contribute to that account if they were older. And if you answer D, awesome, you remembered that catch up contribution. The other two, I don't know, made them up. That, no, those B and C don't make any sense. All right. So let's head into health reimbursement arrangement accounts. So health reimbursement arrangements are HRAs provide a vehicle for employers to make additional contributions to an employee's health care costs. These accounts are funded by the, only by the employer, and they're designed to reimburse employees for their health care expenses up to a fixed amount. Um, it's also important to note that these arrangements are tax-free for both the employer and the employee. So if you're looking at that as a viable option to, or way to save some money for both of your employees and, your, and as the employer, HRAs are a great option if you are choosing one of those high deductible health plans, with which these are able to function in. So again, I'm just going to throw them all on the screen really quick. So health reimbursement arrangements provide significant flexibility, just like HRA or HSAs. First, plans that are paired with an HRA generally have lower premiums than their non-HRA counterparts, just like the HSA accounts. This results in month-over-month -month savings for both employers and employees. HRAs also present employers with funding control. They can choose which expenses they want to reimburse and when. So it's 
a lot of the autonomy is placed on the employer in the scenario with these type of accounts. So for instance, they might want to um, pick and choose when to put money in those accounts for certain expenses. So maybe, you know, any employee that has a surgery, they would put money into that account to help cover parts of that surgery, or they might just throw a chunk of money into that um, account every year at the beginning of the year. They might trickle in a little bit of money each paycheck. They might, um, maybe when they, your employee has a baby, you choose to put that money in the account for the baby. Um, whatever. There's a lot of flexibility that comes with these accounts for the employer and, you know, kind of for the employee as well, because who's going to turn down money to help pay their bills, right? Um, so you could pair the HRA with a group health care plan and choose to contribute to their deductible. You could choose to contribute to their co-insurance or other health care expenses as well. Again, a lot of freedom here for the employer and the employee. There is some financial uh, flexibilities that come with these as well. While there is a fixed maximum amount that employees can be responsible for, there's no fixed minimum. So these accounts don't have to necessarily come with money already set up in them. They could sit at zero. That's fine. Um, employers must only pay out expenses that employees make against the account. So in a period of time where the employees don't submit many claims or purchase less expensive coverage, the unused funds can be returned to the employer's budget. So let's say the employer puts you know $1,000 in there and they have a really healthy employee and the employee only goes and, I don't know, maybe they just go one time and get like a very small expense done. They spend 20 bucks of it. They spend whatever. The rest of that money does not go back to the employee. It goes back to the employer. So they can just see that as extra bonus money if they had loaded that account in the first place, or front loaded that account in the first place, I guess I should say. And last but not least, like we already said, employers should be aware of the tax savings built into these accounts. Employer contributions to an HRA are exempt from payroll taxes and reimbursements are also tax-free. For employers seeking to provide a healthcare benefit to their employees, but who may want to avoid administering a group plan, these types of accounts could be a good fit. We'll talk a little bit more about the details behind how that can work, but those would all technically be considered HRAs if you were going to do something like that as a small employer or a large employer, because even though they're technically named two different things, they, they function similarly. So who can contribute to an HRA? HRAs are owned exclusively by the employer. So the employer is the only one who can contribute to those accounts. The employer would uh, throw funds into the account with designated amounts, there is no obligation to pre-fund the account, um, and it can often be helped, but I guess I should say, it can be helpful for that employer to budget out the amount of money, the maximum amount of money that they would spend off the get and then throw it in the account. And that way, um, you know, things balance out at the end of the quarter, year, whatever, um, so you don't run out of money. I've heard that's bad. I'll have to check in with the roots and see if that's bad or not, but yeah, pretty sure that it is. Um, depending on the type of account that the person has, the employer could choose how to fund the employee's balance. Depending on the budget's flexibility and other considerations, the employer might choose to make the total amount of the funds available on the first day of the plan year, or like we talked about earlier, they might, you know, deposit a little each paycheck, maybe a little each quarter. It's up to the business how they would like to contribute to that account. Employers would then receive regular invoices from their designated HRA administrator, which identifies the amount that would be withdrawn from the account. Don't have to pre-fund the account if you don't want to. To cover that stuff, unless you, you know, that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But employers should be mindful of the possible maximum that they could be subject to in order to make sure that you don't run out of money. So again, lots of flexibility of whether you want to leave those accounts empty and put into them as needed for expenses, or if you want to just throw the money in and then you get bonus money at the end, it's up to the employer. So there are a couple different types of HRAs. Uh, in recent years, a lot of the laws have changed to increase the variety of HRA types available to employers. And there is a little more nuance to that discussion than what I just said, and we're going to talk about it a little later, but we can kind of divide these into three different options. Um, We'll provide, like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the Affordable Care Act changed these regulations to allow um, employers to take advantage of three types of HRAs. 
the integrated HRA, the retiree HRA, the dental vision HRA, or limited purpose HRAs. And then when the 21st Century Cures Act passed in 2017, some employers were called, uh, were better, let me try that again. Some employers were permitted, there we go, to implement qualified small employer HRAs or QSERAs. I'm going to call them QSERAs. That's way easier to say. And then finally, in 2020, we got two more options rolled out to us. We have individual coverage HRAs or ICRAs and accepted benefit HRAs. So we got a lot of options here that have been rolled out between the ACA and 2020. They're going to seem a little redundant or maybe like, why would they have invented this if we don't talk about them in the order that they were born? So we're going to stick to a timeline here just for the sake of understanding what happened. So integrated HRAs, as the name implies, are fully integrated with a group medical plan. These are the ones that we mostly focused on talking about just now and require employees to be enrolled in the plan in order to use that HRA. Each plan and carrier may have its own specific rules for configuring and administering these arrangements. And we encourage you to reach out to the carriers that you partner with for additional guidance there. Because each plan is going to have its own different rules as to exactly how those integrated HRAs are going to shake out. But for the most part, the only uh, steadfast rule that stays the same between each one is that you must be a member of that plan in order to participate with the HRA. Then we got our retiree HRAs. These are built to support retirees with their health care costs. These plans are not required to be integrated with any medical coverage at all, or they can be integrated with medical coverage. That's up to the employer. Um, employers will select one of two options for funding these accounts. They can first roll over an HRA, any leftover HRA funds at the end of that year to an RRA, retiree reimbursement account. Um, the second option is that the employer could make one-time contributions to the retiree's account once they do retire, kind of like a so long and thanks for all the fish to help that retiree with their health expenses. And then we have um, the dental vision HRAs, which I bet you can guess what these are for. The, um, they also get called limited purpose HRAs or dental vision HRAs, mostly because they almost always feed into a dental vision type reasoning to exist. Um, these are funded to, are used to fund dental and vision um, expenses in lieu of maybe dental and vision. Um, not always, but it could be. And that money can only be used for dental and vision. So then, so those were the only three we had for a while from the uh, birth of the ACA until 2017. And then the 21st Century Cures Act created the QSERA. So QSERAs provide even more financial flexibility to employers who had less than 50 employees. Uh, these accounts are intended so small employer accounts, right? So these accounts were intended to allow employers to reimburse employees for premiums that they pay in the individual under 65 market. So basically the government saw this gap between employers who didn't have that HR department or that strong HR department and didn't have the the manpower to administer a health care plan, but still wanted to take care of their employees and um, give them some sort of health care. So what the government allowed for is a QSERA. So the government, so the employer contributes an amount to that account. That account belongs to that employee. That employee then goes onto the marketplace, purchases whatever plan they so choose, and then the money in the QSERA goes towards paying for that health insurance. It can be used for out-of-pocket expenses, co-pays, co-insurance, um, but with subject to whatever rules of the um, QSERA that they have in place with Keith. But the difference here is that employees are not required to enroll in a health plan when taking advantage of this account, unlike those um, integrated HREs we talked about earlier. These plans allow for small employers to provide their employees with a health care benefit without necessarily having to administer a health care plan. And the employee doesn't necessarily have to pick out something on the marketplace in order to use this money. Maybe they just let the money sit there. They choose not to have health insurance. And if they go to the doctor twice a year, you know, maybe they use the money from that QSARE to pay for those accounts. And then we're all Gucci. We don't have any medical bills. Um, so again, 
provides a it's, it it can be viewed, I guess, as the best of both worlds because the employee can say, hey, I do offer some health benefits and you get to pick and choose how you use those health benefits instead of saying, here's the plan that our company is going to provide for you and here's how you're going to contribute to it. You know, so it is an interesting option for those small employees or I'm sorry, small employers who want to do something but don't have the manpower to administer a big old health plan, right? So then... In 2020, we got the ICRAs and the Accepted Benefit HRAs. So ICRAs are basically a blend of integrated HRAs and QSERAs. So basically, the bigger businesses got jealous of QSERAs and wanted some, wanted their own piece of the pie, and we gave them this. So ICRAs are available to any size employee. ICRAs are available to employers, I should say, of any size, but they require that the employees be enrolled in a plan on the individual marketplace, like a Medicare plan, or I'm sorry, individual market or Medicare plan. So the only difference between the QSERA and the ICRA is ICRAs, you have to be in a plan in order to use the money that's in this account. QSERAs, you don't have to be in a plan. Uh, this money is intended to reimburse the cost of premiums, but could be used for other things like co-pays, co-insurance as well. So think of it as, QSERA, but you actually have to have some sort of health insurance to dip into this account. Accepted benefit HRAs may generally be used to reimburse employees for any benefit that Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act defines as accepted, such as things like COBRA premium, short-term medical plans, dental vision, blah, blah, blah. So it's like a dental vision HRA, but a little wider in its ability to pay for other things like COBRA. Um, again, like we said, these two might seem kind of redundant because why not just get a dental vision HRA, but that's because these were meant to include other things other than dental vision, but didn't want to be exclusive to, uh, exclude dental vision from these type of, um, accounts. So in ICRA, same thing, they, it was like a QSERA, but they wanted to make sure that, um, health insurance was getting purchased when these plans or when these uh, savings accounts were made available. So similar, kind of redundant, kind of not. So that kind of draws our HRA types to a close um, for the most part, just as if you're, there's either, I would organize them in my head as either must be with an insurance plan or must not be with an insurance plan and then why. So unlike HSAs, all funds in the account belong to the employer and therefore the employer keeps the funds if a person leaves their employment. The, the money doesn't belong to the employee. All right, so that is all the information I have for you for HRAs. Um, Let's go ahead and check out our next um, question here. So Asagai would like to set up an account to help his seven employees pay for health insurance costs, but he does not want to offer that health insurance plan to them at this time. He's just going to keep it. He, he wants to keep his hands off. Okay. Is he able to do that? Is there a way that he can not offer any health insurance to his employees, but then give them some sort of health benefits? So yes, B is the correct answer here. If you answered any of the other ones, you kind of remembered some of what I said, but not all of it. Um, so A, it can't happen because if he doesn't have health insurance to set up in the first place, um, that amount would be incorrect. And integrated HRAs uh, means that the plan is offered by the company and he doesn't offer one. So in order to offer an integrated HRA, there has to be some health insurance coverage there to integrate with. So can't do A. B is the correct answer. He can set up a QSERA because he has under 50 employees, right? And he can contribute up to $5,150 on each employee's behalf into that account for health insurance, for a health benefit. And remember, because he's under that 50, that he, those employees don't necessarily have to sign up for health coverage in order to ex exercise their benefit of this account, right? They can just use it to go to the doctor twice a year or whatever, and that's, a, that, that's just Gucci, right? So C is straight up untrue. Um, as we talked about earlier, we have QSERAs, we have ICRAs, those um, can be uh, used without any sort of health insurance being offered by the employer. And then D is an antiquated 
uh, thing to say, right? That way before or between the implementation of the ACA and 2017, this would have been true, right? You'd have to have more than fit, uh, more than 50 employees. I'm sorry, the opposite. You would have had less than 50 employees in order to make a QSERA up for your employees, but that's not the case anymore, right? We know that there is ICRAs and H, um, I'm sorry, ICRAs and QSERAs that can be used to support employees depending on how many employees you have in your company. Okay, so our final type of savings account that we will talk about today is an FSA. So FSAs or flexible spending accounts allow employees to set aside money on a pre-tax basis for qualified medical expenses, such as things like medical, dental, vision, deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. So just like the other two, there are some advantages specific to FSAs. FSAs provide an opportunity for employees to offset other out-of-pocket costs associated with their health care plan, such as deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. But we should note that FSAs may be paired with any health plan, not just high deductible ones. So these are a lot more flexible in a way of we don't need to have a certain deductible level to exercise our uh, FSA accounts. We can just, as long as you pick a plan that offers one, you can have one. No biggie. FSAs provide employees with flexibility in how they use their healthcare dollars. They can use the funds for expenses beyond typical healthcare expenses. They can use it for orthodontics. They can use it for sunscreen. They can use it for family planning items. Um, back way back in another life when I was a teacher and I had a plan that had FSA had an FSA, I would use it to buy to stock my medicine cabinet every year because there wasn't really a ton of money in mine because um, I was silly and did not understand what it was really for back when I was teaching because um, I didn't work in health insurance. Um, so I would see that little bit of money in there and go, oh my gosh, cool, and I don't have to buy Zyrtec. And that's, that's what I used it for, Benadryl. Uh, if I would have known back then, right? Um, FSAs, just like the other two, present an opportunity to realize tax savings. Contributions and withdrawals for qualified expenses are tax-free. FSAs can also provide employees with some reassurance. With medical FSAs, the employer makes the employee's annual contribution amount available at the start of the plan year. And so the employee can take full advantage of that amount right away. Payroll deductions throughout the year are used to make that employer whole. However, this does present some risk to the employer since they have no legal mechanism to recapture those funds if they're used on a qualified for a qualified per, uh, purpose. AKA, an employee could use every single one of those dollars on January 1st and then ride off into the sunset January 2nd and the employer would not have any legal way to get that money back. That money belongs to that person January 1st, and that's it. So even if that money was meant to extend throughout the entire year of that person's employment, and they use it all up on January 1st and quit January 2nd, that's on the employer. They just have to eat it, unfortunately. Um, but the other side of that is, if you were like me when you were... Um, when I had an FSA and you didn't completely understand what it was for, um, or at least if you're an employee and didn't understand what it was for, that money would then go back to the employer if it was not used by the end of the year or that by the end of the grace period that might have been provided by that employee. I'm sorry, employer. Um, so hopefully that all comes out in the wash for the employer. So unlike the other two, um, or I'm sorry, unlike HRA, I should say. FSA contributions can come from two places, employees and employers. These get, the money is pre-taxed. Um, some carriers and plans do set a limit on employer contributions, but we won't know for sure until you talk about that individual plan. Excuse me, sorry about that. FSAs are employer-owned, and so employers have a decision to make about what happens to any unused FSA funds at the end of each plan year. First, we've got the use it or lose it. I'm sure you can figure out what we mean here. Um, employers maybe claim any unused funds and use them to pre-fund the benefit for the next year. Or employers may, op may opt to option out a 2.5-month grace period to their employees. 
during that grace period, employees would have full access to the funds, which would then, just as they will with a regular plan year. Or employers could also elect to allow employees to carry up to $640 of their FSA funds over into the next year. But these two options are mutually exclusive. You could not offer both. You can either offer that 2.5 month grace period of the entirety of the funds, or you can allow $640 to get carried over into the next year. You could not do both. Choose wisely. So employers set up and own FSAs. Employees decide how to use the funds, so long as you know it's a qualified medical expense. Up to $640 can roll over each year at the employer's discretion. Leftover money gets put back into the pocket of the employer. And employees are not required to give back the funds that they spend if they leave the group before the end of the year. All right, so second to last knowledge check up here. Jody wants to get a surgery that costs thousands of dollars. Eyeing the benefits of a pre-saving, pre-tax savings account, she contributes the max she can to her FSA and plans to have enough money in that account in about three years for this surgery. What advice would you give Jody regarding this situation if you were her agent? Again, the answer is D, yes. Um, I will point out that this, this is a little tricky of a question as well because Technically, A is true. Um, you should also sometimes um, remind clients that um, some surgeries might not qualify. You have to make sure that all of your expenses in that account qualify before using them for a medical expense. So maybe Jody is getting like, I don't know, Botox and it doesn't count and she's saving up for no reason. Um, but it technically doesn't matter what surgery that it is um, if the money gets eaten back up by the employer at the end of the year um, because it's going over the amount that she's allowed to carry over, right? So remind her, she's probably only be able to carry over about $640. So if that surgery is thousands of dollars, I guess that's the question, it doesn't matter how much she throws into that account to save up for if the employer is just going to take the extra out that doesn't roll over and can give it back to themselves, right? So keep that in mind as you exercise your FSA plans. So this chart we visited a few moments ago briefly summarizes the functionality of consumer-driven health options that are available to both employers and employees. It's certainly not exhaustive like we know um, with those H um, or Qseras and um, ICRAs and integrated HRAs and uh, dental vision, blah, 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 right? Um, but it's pretty overarching in our journey that we just had with these consumer-driven health accounts. So if you're going to screen snip anything from this portion of our, sh or from today's show, I would save this thing, right? But you don't have to, because I'm going to put it up in YouTube. But if you do want to, go for it. <clears throat> so one last question before we part ways today to make sure that you picked up everything I wanted you to. So which statements about consumer-driven health plans are true? Um, if you've been in a webinar with me before, you know that if there is an ability to select more than one answer, there's always more than one answer, right? So don't sleep on multiple answers here. There is more than one thing that I wanted you to learn from me today. That is so if you selected A and C, you are definitely correct. So anyone can contribute to an HSA except for someone who is enrolled in Medicare or turns 65. Employers, C, employers can contribute to HRAs only. That is also correct. B is straight up not correct. Contribution lim and limits for HSAs change every year. And we saw um, there's those differences between 2023 and 2024 um, earlier in our show. Um, and D, I can see you it going either way. You, I could I can see an argument for D being correct and D not being correct, depending on how you're interpreting that. And I did that kind of on purpose because I wanted to talk about it. Um, as we know, and we talked about earlier, FSA funds technically do not roll over from year to year unless that employer chooses to allow $640 in 2024 
to roll over each year, right? So a small portion, depending on how much that employee has in that account, can roll over from year to year if that employee, I'm sorry, if that employer chooses to make that uh, happen for that employee, or as we know, it could be that 2.5 month grace period that they get for the entirety of the amount of money that's in the account. Right, so look, a couple of different options there for FSA funds and how they how they act at the end of the year. But again, you can pick one and one only. You can have that 2.5 month grace period or you can have that $640 rollover. Um, or you can just do use it or lose it. January 1st, we wipe it. That's up to the employer, right? So I purposely made that one vague so that we could talk about it. All righty. So that brings us to the end of our consumer driven health journey today. Um, I thank you very much for spending this time here with me today.